right. So um, for those that don't know, this is Dr. Max Bloomberg, originally from South Africa. He is the founder of HR Analytics Consultancy, Bloomberg Partnership, with uh, it being a, or rather he is its namesake, of course, focusing on workforce transformation through data-driven analytics. He is a research fellow at Goldsmiths University of London and a visiting professor at the University of Leeds Business School, though he's got a quite uh, a much more colorful background than that. I'll leave that to him to explain some of the details I'm waiting to hear more on myself, particularly with regards to your exploits in music. <laughs> and his presentation is called Recruiting the Perfect Employee, a combination of science, technology and magic. So. Max, Dr. Bloomberg, whichever you prefer. If you're happy to proceed, then I will cede the floor to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Joshua, and thank you uh, for inviting me along today. Yes, it's a great, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you, and really the quality of what um, we've heard so far uh, it has been absolutely terrific. So um, I'm really going to present a case study which I think brings together uh, a lot of what Dave uh, and Jan were talking about, um, and uh, I hope it's useful to you. Um, as Joshua mentioned, I'm not so sure about the colourful background part, but uh, he's right. I, I did start life uh, as a professional musician, and if you look on the um, at the back of the car sitting there with a lot of hair, uh, that was me uh, when I was in the band, um, and then after a couple of years of doing people analytics on the right hand side, you can see what people analytics does to you. Uh, so there you are. But aside from uh, being a musician and somehow miraculously getting one hit, actually the story behind the hit Joshua for what it's worth is somebody told me that I could not write a hit record. Um, and the one way to get me to do anything is to tell me I can't do it. Um, so I think that the, re the rebel still lives on. Um, I started out life as a computer scientist um, and I started a technology company. Uh, and it was while I had the technology company that I started developing an interest in psychology. So I did a PhD in psychology uh, with my computer science background, uh, then got really interested in maths and statistics, et cetera. And in fact, I'm now doing another PhD, this time in artificial intelligence. Um, but all the way through, the common link has been about people and organizations and how do you get the best performance out of your employees and have happy employees at the same time. And I believe that there is a lot of science in doing that. And that's what I'd like this case study to present. Um, I really enjoy doing leading edge uh, case studies, re leading edge projects. So um, I'm not that fond of reporting in analytics. I like using uh, AI, machine learning, um, multivariate statistics, et cetera, where possible, so that we deliver really powerful results as I believe all people analytic professionals uh, should be doing. Um, so without further ado, well, what I want to do is have a look at how you improve employee performance. And we'll look at a case study of what we did to get through that. Um, all I want to say is that if you want to improve employee performance, there are four things that I think you need to do. The first thing is that you need to find a performance measure uh, where there's a problem. So it might be your call centers that uh, you're not getting the right kinds of performance uh, time to close, retention rates of customers, um, acquisition rates. It might be your engineers that you're not getting um, successful rates on customer feedback or number of cases being closed. Any performance measure, the most common performance measure that we know about usually is performance ratings as in your annual performance review. Or, or if you're Gen Y or Gen Z, your daily or hourly performance review. But whatever, uh, that's what we think of as performance, and we'll look at that a little bit. So you find a problematic uh, performance measure, and then you rank your people on that measure. And that's what this picture in front of you is all about, is that you put the people with the lowest uh, ratings or rankings down here on the left, and the people with the highest rankings on the right-hand side. So in a sense, um, you could say they're going from tall to short. Now, I'm not saying that short people have got low uh, performance and that tall people have got high performance. I'm just doing this to, to indicate uh, you sort the people. 
Once you've got your performance rating sorted from low to high, then all you have to do is pull a line through the middle, which is what we call the median in statistics, if you're interested in that sort of thing. Um, and you say, what is different about these low performers? What is different about the short people compared to the tall people? And once you know what is different about them, uh, you can then build a people process, recruitment, training, succession planning, uh, career development, some sort of process which takes into account those differences. So if it's training, let's say that all of the people on the right-hand side here, um, let's say that they have all had a lot more training than the people on the left-hand side. Well, then if you want to improve performance in your workforce in this particular group, all you do is make sure that the people on the left-hand side get as much training as the people on the right-hand side. Um, and if your statistical model validates that, you have improved performance. It's really as simple as that. Four steps. What is the problem? What is the people process that we need to fix? Is it recruitment, training, etc.? What is the difference between low and high performers in that process? And create a new process. And here are those four steps. And we'll be referring back to these as I go through uh, the case study where we implemented this. Um, so uh, step one, as I said, start with a problematic performance outcome. Step two, which people processes uh, lie behind the problematic performance? Step three, whoops, sorry. Step three, what are the differences between high and low performers in this process? And four, use these differences to implement a new improved process. Um, Joshua, can I just ask you, is the screen maximized or can I push a button here so that we get animations, et cetera, as a matter of interest? Uh, they should be able to see your video at the top right of the presentation, but I, I'm not sure if you want to try to introduce video or not. I mean, it, it would have I don't to- I don't introduce the video. I just, um, can I maximize the screen as I would in PowerPoint? so that I get all of these slides have got animations on them. It's not critical or anything mm -hmm. like that. If I push the right arrow, um, mm -hmm. theory, it should bring the next animation on. Um, Are you in presentation mode on your side? So, sorry, everybody. It just it doesn't make a difference. I think if it's not something you're able to do when you uh, click along at the bottom, it's probably not something that's available. For no problem. Particular. No problem at all. Let me just have a look to see here if there's a button that says presentation. No, no problem. We'll carry on and we'll do that here. So let's have a look um, at the company uh, th uh, that we're talking about. Um, and it's rent to kill uh, initial. And interestingly, a lot of this work was done in Cologne in Germany. So I spent a lot of time, uh, it's a global project, um, but uh, one of the Rent-A-Kill Initials large centers is in, um, is in Cologne. So, so if you don't know who Rent-A-Kill Initial are, um, Rent-A-Kill part of the business is about pest control. So that is about killing things. Um, and actually, the Latin word entomology is about insects and so on. So it's ento kill uh, is a bit of a pun. Anyway. And initial, if you go into a bathroom in a corp many corporates, the hand dryers or the towels or whatever you have, you'll often see the initial logo. So they are a service company um, and they do bathroom cleaning for corporates, providing towels, uh, sanitary products, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is uh, rent a kill initial, a uh, huge, uh, huge organization. Um, and the, uh, they, had a, they have a global sales force uh, of 700 people. Um, and many of these people were not reaching their targets. Now, they had every consultancy under the sun uh, coming in, um, uh, but they weren't getting consistent answers about how to fix the sales problem in the company. And the CEO, a uh, guy by the name of Alan Brown at that stage, said there must be a scientific way to fix this. Um, at which point, uh, the HRD, who I knew, I don't know how I knew him, uh, he came to me and said, Max, you've just finished a PhD in psychology. Um, you love statistics. Isn't there some uh, way that you could do this? Now, bear in mind, this was about mm, 2011, 2012. So this was before our, our inboxes 
were filled with the word people analytics. Um, so from my perspective, I was just coming to this like a scientific problem. I was being a scientist. Um, I was going to say, what is my outcome variable, my metric? Um, what are my hypotheses about what might be affecting that metric? And I'm going to try and fix it uh, today. And that is still the method that we should all be using um, in people analytics to solve problems. Uh, I'm not sure that it's that common, and I think Dave alluded to that uh, a little bit earlier about the education, et cetera, um, but perhaps we can talk about that another day. But essentially, that is the business problem here, is we've got sales performance around the world is very inconsistent. So in terms of what uh, the model I say to you is you need to start with a problematic performance outcome. Um, so you might say, well, it's just the sales figures of the people. You know, it's that they're, they're achieving uh, $50,000 instead of uh, $100,000 or whatever. But for those of you who've done analytics with sales teams, you, you will know that you can't just look at a salesperson's dollar figure, can you? Um, because their sales figure might be because um, they've got a fantastic sales manager that's helping them. So it doesn't reflect their potential as a salesperson. Uh, it's more a reflection of their sales manager. Or maybe that salesperson got a really good patch that the previous salesperson had built up and they're just living off the work of the previous person. So what you need to do generally when in any people analytics project is that your outcome variable needs to be what I call um, a basket uh, of metrics. And in this case, you can see the basket that we use. You, you might well choose a different basket depending on what the problem is that you're facing. So I'm not saying that this is the one basket that you need to use. This was the correct basket for us. The first column is quite interesting, uh, I thought. It's the annual performance score from their performance rating. I don't believe in these at all. None of the managers believed in them either, even though they were doing it. But because they had just spent 2 million euros on a new performance management system from a very well-known human capital consultancy, um, the boss said to me, Max, uh, you had better include the performance scores. Otherwise, it looks like we've wasted 2 million. I said, no problem. I'll put them in. Um, and we'll just give them a lower weighting. The next trick that we used, if you like, is that I asked the first line managers, this is rank one, I asked the first line managers if they would uh, rank the salespeople from the highest potential, uh, we'll call that a six, um, to the lowest potential, and we call that a one. So we say, who's the best? If you look at it, um, well, if you look at our sort of left to right there, tall to short, um, you say, who is the best person uh, in your team? And they'll say that is Muhammad. And who is the weakest person in the team? And they'll say that's Lee. And then you'll say, who is roughly halfway? Um, and then you'll say, who sits between the top one and the middle one? And so on until you end up with from highest to lowest. And then you just have to, if there, if there are 18 people in the team there and you're ranking one to six, then 18, 17, 16 will be a six, uh, 15, 14, 13 will be a five, four, three, two, one, et cetera. So if you look at this diagram here of the people tall to short, this lot here, we'll call them sixes. This next lot are fives, fours, threes, twos, and Danny DeVito is a one um, at the end. Then the next kind of trick that we did was we also got the second line manager to do exactly the same exercise and to rank the salespeople. Now, you might say, why do you want to get a second ranking? And the reason we do that is that what happens if the first line manager is really biased against one of the one of the um, team or, or really in favor? So what we wanted to do is to sense check. And actually, that turned out to be a really good idea. Because if you look at this David J here, you can see that the first line manager has said he's fantastic. He's in that very top group on the right hand side. Uh, but the second line manager says, oh, he's absolutely terrible. He's got no potential at all. He's a one. And so you start wondering, are we even talking about the same person? And what we would do is we would fire off an email to both of those uh, managers and we would say, could you sort out why you've got such a different view of David J. And that conversation is so critical for people analytics because what it forced the managers to do is to say, what does good look like? Because the one might say, well, I gave him a six because he's always early for work. Um, 
And the second line manager would say, well, you know, I gave him a one uh, because his sales are rubbish. And they would then say, so you think that sales is more important than coming early to work, which seems obvious to me. Um, but as you can see, if you can get your managers to have conversations about what good looks like, then you have a decent outcome metric. And as anybody uh, in statistics will tell you, if your outcome metric isn't correct, the whole study is flawed. And then and finally, I included a column for tenure, how long the employee has been in the organization. Now, you might say that's really unfair um, to include tenure, and I'll explain to you why I include it in a second. So if you add up all of these scores here, uh, the four, four, six, six, uh, you get the total score. Now, why do we include tenure? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you can see here is that the shortest people, Danny DeVito and co, they've definitely all got a low performance score, low ranking and a short tenure. In other words, a low number of one there. The high people have clearly all got high performance, long tenure, high rank uh, one and two. The people in the middle are more interesting. They are a mix of highs and lows. And so what we're saying is what is the difference between the low performers and the high performers? All we're saying is that the more towards the right hand side you are, the longer you've probably been in the organization. Now, why is that important? Because when you are recruiting people, you want to recruit people that are going to stay in your organization who fit into your culture. Um, and that's what these people are right. They are high performers and they are people who have stayed with the company. And that's what you recruit. So whenever you're doing people analytics for recruitment, for example, you should always think about um, can we bias the scores towards our high performers who've been here for a while? Okay. So the next question, as you might recall, is to find out, well, which process is letting us down? Which is causing this high variance in performance? And so I, I made the mistake, because this was the first time I'd ever done one of these projects, I made the mistake of asking the sales directors around the world um, at rent a -Kill, uh, about what process was the problem. And the American said to me, oh, it's all about sales retention. Um, we don't have good retention because it takes 18 months for salespeople to learn their trade, but they never stay here for 18 months. And so they leave. And so you know, the high performers are people who stay with us and the low performers are people who leave. Um, in Asia, the Asian director said, you know, it's all about our training is really bad. We need to improve our training performance, uh, our training in the company. So the high performers have had good training and the low performers have had weak training. The British guy uh, said that it's all about motivation. Now, he may have had a point because he used to take his team out drinking every night. Um, and partying, and they did do really well, I have to say. Um, so there was a good argument that engagement and motivation, maybe that is the thing to look for. Um, and the Holland uh, uh, guy said to us, um, and I like love his words, he says, you know, salespeople are eager, hungry, arrogant, angry, lazy, extroverted, naughty individuals who love recognition, compliments, cars, and money. He calls it the coin-operated hypothesis that you put money into salespeople like a slot machine and they work. And if you stop putting money into them, the salespeople stop working. So what that taught us really early on is that there was absolutely no consensus at all um, amongst the directors about what the problem was. So we needed to find a way to open it up to the whole sales force to ask them. And briefly, I just want to show you a model that we use. Um, and I've written quite a lot about this. It's quite a well-known model now and quite well used. But what the model says is that you start in a company with a number of people processes, like you've got career development and competency management and recruitment and learning and development and reward. And the reason that you've got these processes is so that you can develop a set of workforce capabilities like engagement and performance and leadership capability and so on. And the reason that you want those capabilities is because they are what give you your four key performance drivers in any company, which is productivity, quality, which is the extent to which your products and services meet the needs of your market, innovation, and customer growth depth and share of wallet. And the reason that you want these key performance drivers is that that is what gives you your revenue, your return on investor capital, return to shareholders, et cetera. So just to summarize that is that if you have the right people practices, processes, if you like, in your company, 
that will give you the workforce capabilities you need to enable your key performance drivers, which will give you the business outcomes you need. And if you are doing people analytics in an organization, you should always be working backwards through that chain. You should always be saying, what is the business problem? We have a problem with revenue in this particular case. Now, then you say, which of our key performance drivers is letting us down? Oh, it's productivity and customer growth. Okay, well, which of our workforce capabilities is getting in the way of our productivity and customer growth? Oh, uh, it's because we've got very bad engagement, leadership capability and talent management. Oh, well, which of our processes is causing us to have bad engagement, leadership capability and uh, talent management? So when you explain the model, you say the processes enable your business outcomes from left to right. But if you are looking to fix a people process using analytics, you start with the business problem on the right and you go left to identify which is the problematic process. So what we then do to use, how do you use that model in a practical way? Well, our first naive version of the uh, profiler was this. All we do is we ask the whole sales force, absolutely everybody in the sales force, we say, thinking about your recruitment process, how important is recruitment for achieving the sales targets? And the second question is, how good are we at recruitment in the organization? So how important is recruitment and how good are we at recruitment? So if recruitment is important, <laughs> but we are very bad, then we know we've got a problem with that. And so I got scores here from all 700 of the people, plus the sales managers, plus the whole line all the way up to the CEO to do the score. We normally interview the, the, the senior directors and I plot them on a graph. So here from going from left to right, you can see this is how important is the process for getting sales. And going downwards here, how good are we at it? So here we are very, uh, very bad. Uh, and here we are very good. So what we are looking for is which processes are important, the right hand side, but we are very bad. And you can see very clearly that recruitment, very important, and we're very poor. And the next one was induction or onboarding. And so we knew that we needed to be working on the uh, recruitment process, which showed us that the Hollander was right. You know, salespeople, we're not recruiting eager, hungry, arrogant, angry, lazy, extroverted, naughty individuals who love recognition, compliments, cars, and money. So he hit it on the head. And we could prove it now from the perspective of the sales force. Um, a lot of people, by the way, say to me, but Max, that's just the opinion of the sales force. And my answer is, well, if it, if we think that actually it's the career development process rather than recruitment, and we fix the career development process in that organization, do you think that we're going to have the managers and the salespeople behind us when they all believe it is the recruitment process? So there's another very important principle. The first thing to fix in an organization is what the majority of the employees feel. You can always circle back and fix these other processes at a later stage if you want to, but it's really important for engagement uh, to fix what the people tell you is actually wrong. So now we come to the next step, which is what is the difference in terms of recruitment between these people and these people here, the high performers and the low performers. And to do that, um, we ran some focus groups with the best salespeople and the best sales managers. In other words, the people that were reaching their targets very clearly. And they gave us um, some very interesting uh, words. Uh, they gave me the stuff in black. So they said they were organized, disciplined. The good ones were planners. The good ones were listeners, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I, as a psychologist, then grouped those into uh, categories, if you like, for psychometric testing. So, you know, these three represent conscientiousness, if you're using um, what they call a five-factor model, um, adversity quotient, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and 
we also did as a matter of interest for those of you who that look after sales forces, um, we also looked at what are the difference between hunters and farmers. Um, if you're not familiar with sales terminology, uh, a farmer is an account manager, somebody who looks after an existing account, whereas a hunter is the person that goes out and wins new accounts. Um, so it's quite important to know what are the difference between your hunters and farmers. And from all of these lists, we spent a long time trawling the market, looking for tests uh, which meet those criteria. So what is the fewest number of tests that measure everything here? Uh, and it boiled down to a personality test. Um, you can see a workplace needs and motivation, a strategic and tactical ability and interest in sales, uh, customer orientation, and cognitive ability, which is basically IQ tests. And what we did was we then put those tests into a uh, model. Uh, we, in those days, we used binary logistic regression. Uh, today, we might choose to use uh, a random forest or something simple. We certainly used multi-level modeling. If you don't know what that is, please do um, look on my LinkedIn profile. I've written an article uh, about multi-level modeling, which is essential to use nowadays uh, and always has been in um, organizations where you've got groups of people. And um, the results of that regression, the question we want to know is which of these tests is best at distinguishing between the high and the low performers? That's what we are asking the regression. Um, or, you know, We hope that one of the tests is good because there's no way to know uh, beforehand whether we've done that. We've chosen the tests very carefully, so they must be multilingual, they must be peer-reviewed, uh, in other words, by academics to show uh, that it's true because the vendor will always tell you that the test is fantastic, but you actually want to peer review it to test if that's true, etc. So with that in mind, here were the results of the tests. You can see that strategic and tactical ability um, on this group um, were able to distinguish with 55% accuracy between the high and the low performers. Now, if you consider that if you flip a coin a hundred times and you guess heads or tails, uh, you'll probably get it right 50% of the time anyway. So 55 is not very different to what you would get if you were guessing. Whereas personality in this instance, as Jan was uh, saying earlier, which is very interesting, personality in with this particular group was able to distinguish with 80% accuracy whether somebody was standing on the right-hand side, high performer, or standing. Now, that is incredible because uh, I'll let you into uh, a, a secret. My, my PhD was about what makes happy couple romantic relationships. Uh, is it about personality or is it about communication? Um, and my research clearly showed that personality is completely unimportant. So, you know, if you and your partner are unhappy with each other, you can't blame their lousy personality for the state of your relationship. But as soon as that person closes the door at home and comes to work, suddenly their personality is incredibly important. Um, so that was really interesting uh, for me. So now that we knew it was personality, we could take those personality traits um, and build them into a new sales process. And this is where we built the process. And most of you will recognize these. You can see we used the information that we got, and it differs by country um, in multi-level modeling. So there's one overall model, um, but it differs um, by country. It gives a different weight, et cetera. Um, we even used the traits from the personality test to um, – Advertise, we gave it to the copywriter. So in Germany, let's say that extroversion uh, and conscientiousness were very important. We give this to the German copywriters and their adverts would say something like, you know, do you like working with a lot of detail? Um, and do you love people? If so, we've got the perfect job for you. Whereas in um, England, it might be introverts that are important. Um, and so the advert would read, for example, are you somebody who's very independent, enjoys working on your own? Uh, we've got the job for you. So we were even able to use it for the advertising. Um, obviously, we also used it for psychometric testing here in step five. So we got full value out of the tests uh, that we got, uh, that we used. By the way, most of the vendors gave us the tests for free. Uh, just to speak to uh, Jan's earlier point, uh, we told them that we didn't know whether their test would be the winning test, you know, 
uh, in terms of which would predict the best um, because it varies from 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 company to company, etc. Um, and all of the test providers, Hogrefer, uh, Hogan, etc. Everybody was willing to give us the tests uh, for free to do the uh, pilot study on the 700 people. It was a huge logistic exercise, um, but it certainly meant that uh, we reduced the risk of not finding a good result. And uh, you can see the results uh, of the uh, exercise are here. Um, we were fortunate to be able to split candidates, applicants coming in um, between the old recruitment process and our new cool process with the um, with the testing, um, et cetera. And the new candidates that came in after three months in the UK were selling 17% more than the uh, old process. In the US after 12 months, uh, they were selling 32% more. Uh, and you can see similar figures. So from the client perspective, um, the sales improvement of the people coming in on the new process they sold after a year on average 40% more um, as a result of using the new process. The increase in one year at Rentacle Initial um, as a result of doing this was $70 million, and the ROI on the project was 300%, which clearly means we didn't charge nearly enough um, for our work because I would have, I'm sure they would have been happy with 150%. Um, and that is the end of the story. So thank you very much for um, for listening and for joining me on that. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much, Max. Very sure. interesting. So as before, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat, and I will read them out for Max. So uh, a question I had is, I you talk about the difference between countries in terms of the lack of consensus and then the resulting sales performance. Are there any factors that you believe could be causing these variants across countries or is it more down to a particular team or the context? I think all of those uh, are factors, in fact, Joshua. Um, I mean, there are cultural differences that we know about, for example, between um, well, you're from the States, I'm originally from South Africa, uh, and in England, we, there are even differences between the north and the south of England. So we might find that, you know, um, it, for example, when northerners come to the south, they find southern people very conservative, very quiet. They don't talk to each other. They're not very sociable. So we would say that if a salesperson from the north behaved like a northerner selling in the south of England, um, they would get a very strange reaction. You need to adapt your behavior to the culture or the context that you're working in. So I guess what we're saying is that a global profile is really bad um, in most jobs because what we're saying is does what it takes to be a successful salesperson in Greece, is it different to what it takes to be a successful salesperson in America? And the answer, the exercise clearly showed is absolutely. I would say that it may even be different. What does it take to be a high performing accountant in Greece uh, compared to America? I would guess that's different. And in fact, the answers even differed within rent -a kill that what it took to sell the pest products in rent -a kill to perform well is very different to what it took to um, perform well selling initials. So in England, when you're recruiting for the rent -a kill part of the business, you recruited very different people to what you recruited in the initial part of the business. Um, so those differences are absolutely important and, and you should take them into account is the answer. Hmm, I see. Um, are there circumstances where, was in one of your earlier slides, you, you suggested that uh, the training program was perhaps not so effective or efficient, right? Yeah. Uh, are there circumstances where that might may be different, where they could have a significant impact on their performance, or is that uh, more of a more of a blanket case, if you know what I mean? So we often find so that's a really interesting question. When we get called in, uh, if I go back to that slide uh, where we look at the processes here, we normally get called in and somebody says, can you do some analytics on our training program? Or can you do some analytics on our career development? 
And what we say is, how do you know that that is the process that is the problem? Um, we then run this human capital value uh, exercise to so that we can get an output like this to show us what the employees believe on the problem. And the employees are usually the best people to tell you because they are the ones going through these processes. I mean, if your employees don't know about the quality of your processes, who, who does in the organization? Mm -hmm. Now, I would say that the most common call that we get is for recruitment, actually. People say, can you help us design a recruitment process? Um, very often, it isn't the recruitment, they're wrong. Um, it's the training process. Uh, that is the problem. What do you do, though, as a consultant, Joshua? <laughs> you know, when a client has got a big check, now, you know, a client is saying, you know, we would like you to come in and fix our recruitment process. Do you say we refuse? Um, we think the problem is your training process. So it's a huge problem. That's why an exercise like the Human Capital Value Profiler, before you start doing analytics to ensure that you're looking, working on the right process, is important. Training is incredibly common, though, as as a problem. So we find that, uh, and training, I'll tell you why I think it's often bigger than recruitment, because the training that they do in Greece is often very different to the training that you get in the US compared to the training you get in the UK, contain, compared to the training you get in Asia. Training is something that's very difficult to standardize. Of course, if you're using an e-learning platform or digital platform, that makes it easier. But in interactive skills like sales, I would argue, uh, especially B2B sales, um, is a very interactive uh, process. So therefore, there's bound to be some classroom or there should be some classroom. In fact, there's some really interesting research showing um, where classroom uh, training is much better than online training. So really, I'm working at a, with a retailer at the moment where we're looking at this and some amazing findings how in retail, classroom training in many instances is much better um, than digital uh, training. So the bottom line is that training is quite difficult to standardize. And if you don't have standardized training around the world, and if it's not aligned with the needs of the culture in the country that you're working with, you'll often get huge disparities in performance. So training is training and recruitment are, are normally critical. But you know, that's not to say that career development isn't important um, if you're looking at retention in an organization. Uh, Etc. So it really depends. You you need to do this kind of exercise to confirm, if you like, that you're about to fix the right process. Otherwise, you end up spending a lot of time and a lot of money fixing something that's down here. That you're, I mean, you're obviously not going to fix something that you're doing well uh, and that isn't important. But it is amazing. Um, how many companies work on processes that are actually serving them reasonably well? So yeah, it's a great question. Okay. Uh, just out of interest regarding your uh, your academic research, why do you think, because I'm sure you thought about it a lot, why there's this disparity in importance of personality between, say, personal and professional relationships? Or in other words, what makes it so important in the professional world as opposed to the personal world? You know, I'm not often stumped for an answer. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> as Dave will tell you, I just don't know. I don't know. Uh, I wonder if it was because we used logistic regression rather than linear regression, but I'm terrified to admit that the technique we used could make such a difference because that means that in one of those contexts, we used the wrong technique. Um, and generally, they'll give you a similar answer. Um, maybe it's just something to do with uh, the cells that make up human beings. Mm -hmm. When you are in the chemicals that are released in our brains, the pheromones, etc., cetera, um, that come into action when we are in a romantic relationship are hopefully uh, not present when we're at work. Um, and those, those hormones may be mediators, uh, if I use a very statistical term, um, that hormones mediate the relationship um, in relationships and don't come into play at work. But I find it really hard to believe that, you know, the question is, do hormones come into work? So if you have a manager that you get on really well with, I'm not saying you're going to have a huge amount of oc oxytocin suddenly flooding your brain and bonding with your manager. But, you know, I'm not sure that some of the feelings we have at work are that different to the feelings we have at home. Um, so to the extent that you, Joshua, believe that 
our feelings at home and our feelings at work are really different, that would be a suitable explanation for why personality is important in one and not in the other. If you believe that, um, in fact, that the feelings are quite similar at work and home, it's just a question of degree, uh, then you would say that personality should be important in both. Um, but it's a great idea for a study if you're looking to do a PhD. <laughs> that was very much not my field, but I'll give it a thought anyway, just because. <laughs> I'd love to supervise if you do. Oh, well, I might have to take you up on that. Yeah. A uh, question from Ignacio in the chat. Max, do you happen to have any lecture recommendations on training effectiveness assessment? I do. Um, if you link up with me on LinkedIn, I'll send you some stuff. I've written some articles. So if you look under uh, posts on my name, you'll see some uh, material that I've written. And I'm very happy to... Um, to do that with you. Uh, Dave mentioned that we're putting together this um, positioning game uh, for people analytics. Um, and one of the things we'll be doing there um, is so that Ignatia, you'll be able to come along to a group like that uh, and ask questions of us and we will provide materials uh, and answer any questions that we can. Uh, we, we ask you to send us the questions before the meetings so that we have a chance to prepare because we don't want to be caught uh, without the answers, we want to look clever, uh, that we have the answers for everything. But um, do look out for uh, Dave will be putting some um, times uh, and ways that you can get hold of material from us. Um, and you're welcome to ask questions about any aspect of HR or people analytics. And if we can't answer it, we will bring in other experts uh, to help. So we might bring in you know, Alec Levinson from the University of Southern California or Jan, uh, if it comes to, you know, testing, et cetera, Joshua um, and so on. So we will find experts. It will be a forum which solves your problems uh, and we'll find experts to do those for you. Okay, great. Uh, just one more question from me uh, with regards sure. to personality. So you mentioned that in this group, at least, that that was uh, maybe the most crucial factor. Do you yeah. think that when with regards to retention, there's there can be a variance? So in other words, that the longer you're there, do you think it's plausible that the personality can become more or less important over time as they sort of integrate to the team and learn their trade, so to speak? Does that make any sense? Do you think you're asking the question there that does personality change over time? Is that... Is that, that, is, is, that, that is another... Uh, uh, that's sort of somewhat tangential, but very related question, sure. So, so ask the first part of the question again, please. So in terms of employee retention, does, uh, does personality, say, at, at the first, in the first month, would you say that personality would be more or less important than 18 months at the end of that, that sort of yeah. period of time? So okay, that's a great question. So, so if you think back to um, more of the relationship research that I was looking at, so there you've got personality in interaction with uh, environment, where the environment is your relationship um, that you're in. What we showed there is that over time, personality is never important, uh, although it may be important at the beginning, uh, because when you meet somebody, uh, we relationships of similar personalities have much higher satisfaction scores with the relationship. Um, however, we're usually interesting attracted to people who are unlike us, um, which is not good. So the thing that attracts you in the beginning is the thing that drives you apart uh, in the end. Um, I can well believe, and this is a hypothesis on my part, is that conscientious people are more likely to stick out the job for the first month, even if the organizational environment is really bad. Um, however, if the organizational environment gets bad enough, even a conscientious person is going to leave uh, the organization at that point. So I would be willing to bet that if you look at the personalities of people that leave an organization, you'll probably find that conscientious people are the last to leave. They, they stick it out the longest to answer your question. I see. And the answer is don't rely on personality for fixing retention. Um, you should probably think about relying on organizational factors to mm -hmm. your career development, have nice, flexible working, uh, nice managers, et cetera, et cetera. Don't, don't rely purely on personality for it.